Amen. 
that shark is greater sin. So there's no need to bring a lot of ayat from Quran and things like this to prove that shirk is a uh, greater sin. But, however, it's important to understand what this true meaning of shirk is. What does it mean? Because we know when we look deeper into this sin, we'll be able to stay away from it. But if we don't know too much, we just say, okay, it's associating partners with Allah. But it's a lot more deeper than that. It's more complex than that. We can believe in Allah and also commit shirk at the same time, unknowingly, if we don't know. So we need to delve into it a little bit and discuss some things, so that way we can understand this sin better and understand uh, what the greatest right of Allah is, so that way we can give that right to Allah by not associating partners with Him. In Holy Quran, Surah Nisa, Ayat 48, Allah says, Inna Allah la yaghfiru an yushraka bihi wa yaghfiru ma duna dalik la ma yasha. Allah doesn't, for, surely Allah does not forgive that anything is associated with Him, and He forgives besides that whatever He likes. وَمَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَقَدْ اِفْتَرَى إِثْمًا عَدِيمًا And whoever associates with Allah anything, he is making a great sin against Allah. So Allah is saying that this sin of shirk is something that He doesn't forgive. But other sins other than that, He forgives them. So we see how great magnitude this sin is of shirk. Where all other sins could be forgiven, but sin of shirk, not forgiven. So it's termed as unforgivable sin. But this is not for someone who was a mushrik, for example, who's committing shirk and then turns away from shirk, turns towards Allah. It's not saying that this sin he did before or she did before is not forgiven. No. It's the person who is persisting in shirk throughout their life. They are continuously associating partners with Allah. And they know uh, what they are doing. So we have to look at why is this sin greatest sin? First of all, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who established the, ro the, the laws and the rules. <laughs> So Allah is the one who has made the laws. So Allah can tell us which law is more important and which one is less. Which sin is greater and which sin is less. Maybe we see something and think this thing is greater than the other thing. But our opinions don't matter in this. Allah is the one who made the divine law. He sets the precedence for what is greater than the others. This is the first thing that we have to establish. Some people might come and say, okay, how can a thought, because shirk is a thought, it's a belief, something in you. How can this sin be worse than another sin, which is hurting somebody, for example, a crime, maybe a murder or theft or these things. How can shirk be greater than these things? Is something someone might come and say it's the doubt that people have but we can we're going to take a few examples the first example is when we look in our society today we see that some people do think that the thought of a crime is worse than the crime itself this is why we have criminal punishment for conspiracy they say you thought about killing somebody or selling some type of drugs, you conspired, you thought about it, and sometimes they get more time for thinking about it than the one actually who did it. Because they were planning and plotting and doing these things. This is one thing. So from our society, we do see that a thought sometimes is greater than the actual crime itself. The people who didn't even do the crime and they're getting punished for thinking about the crime. This is just one example from our life. Another thing, when we commit a crime against someone else, that person might forgive us. They might overlook this thing. And uh, we see example with uh, Ura bin Yazid al-Riyahi. 
commit crime against Imam by blocking him, keeping him in that place, preventing water from him. Imam Hussein salam, forgives him. It's done. That sin happened one time. We take something from somebody. We hurt someone's feelings. We do something against someone. We apologize. They say, okay, apology accepted. The sin is over. It's done. We see the family of a murderer. Someone murders a family. They go to the courtroom. Family maybe hug that person and say, you know, I forgive you. I don't want you to live with that guilt, and uh, we forgive you on behalf of uh, family. So we see that sometimes we have some sins, but they are one time they're doing an action against someone else. And then after that action, the sin is stopped. It's only a one-time thing. It's not something continuous. But when we see the sin of shirk, it is a continuous sin. All of the time, because we have that belief, and someone who has that belief and that thought process in their mind is constantly rejecting the oneness of Allah throughout their whole life, actively denying Allah or associating partners with Allah. So he has to stop that sin in order for that sin to be forgiven. We cannot continue sinning and expect forgiveness at that moment while we're doing sin. Whereas in another case, a crime is done one time, and they're stopping that crime. No one is continuously uh, killing a person or continuously uh, stealing every moment of his life. Maybe he steals one or two or three times a day, and he doesn't steal anymore. But shirk was constantly in the mind that, we are, that that person is rejecting Allah. So this is why we see that one other reason that this sin is greater than other sins. Also, when we look, another point is when we look at crimes, they vary in degrees depending on who the crime was against. Right? So. For example, it's natural for us, we see someone in the street, they kill another person. We say this act is horrible, right? Uh, then when we see the same crime committed against someone else, for example, that man killed another man, they had an argument in a gas station or something, and they, this guy killed the other guy. It's bad. It's not good. Okay, that's against this man. Now, if, imagine a man killing someone else, but that person was his mother. How would we look at that? This person, this mother nurtured that child, raised that child, and took care of that child, and then the person killed his mother or his grandmother. We see it, it's both murder, but we see it as something greater. So, oh my God, this person, he killed his own grandmother. How, like, terrible is that? We look at it as more than him killing someone else, a random stranger in a parking lot, or someone he got in an argument with in uh, traffic, for example. So, you know, if we look at this, what about the sin of shirk, or the sin against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's even more. Allah is the nurturer of all of the universe. If we look so great on the person killing the one who nurtured their child, imagine a sin against the one who nurtures everyone. The one who gives us air to breathe, the one who gives us sustenance, who gives us life, is of a greater magnitude than committing a crime against someone else. This is another point about shirk. So, despite this, people are still committing this sin against Allah, and they're still committing shirk, but Allah is so merciful that His door is always open for them to turn back to Him. And even though they are rejecting Him, He's still providing them the faculties that they need. He's still giving them that air, that sustenance, whether they believe in Him or not. I remember reading something, and uh, this guy was calling on an idol over and over and over and over again, like hundreds of times, like repeating the name of that idol over and over and over. 
in that idol's name, he made a, sl a slip in that idol's uh, name. For example, the uh, idol in Mecca would be like Uzza, for example, and then he's saying this over and over, and he slips, instead of saying, calling on the idol, he says, Aziz, he calls one of Allah's names, Allah says, here I am, I am here for you, turn to him. Just like this, he's calling all these times, but Allah is so, so merciful, as soon as he called on him one time, I am here. He's welcomed back to the path. We have narration from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. He says, don't you see that the sun shines on the believers and the non-believers and that the rain comes down on the good and the bad? SubhanAllah, Allah is gracious. Even those people who are fighting against Allah, promoting atheism, promoting uh, that there is no God, rejecting Allah, uh, coming against those people and fighting them who, who believe in God, Allah is still providing them. Imam is saying that the sun shines on them just like the sun shines on you. One of the scholars, he says, uh, when it rains, it falls on both of the houses, the believer and the non-believer. And when the sun shines, he says it shines in the house of Rasulullah and also the house of Abu Jahl, the enemy of Allah. Allah is giving sun to both. He said the rivers pass through the city of the believers, also city of the disbelievers. He says Allah's blessings are always like this. It's the nature of this world. Allah is constantly giving people chances to think about the bounties that they are giving, to have them come back. The shirk also is one of the greatest sins because it's the root cause of all of the other sins. It's the root cause, uh, this corruption in belief is the head of all other corruptions. Because when you're committing shirk, all of the actions that the person who is doing, they are, they are not accepted. It's causing to wipe out the actions of the person. Allah says in Quran, Surah 24, Ayat 39, the deeds of the believers are like a mirage which a thirsty man thinks is water, until he goes near it and he finds nothing. Instead, he finds Allah who gives him his due recompense. Allah's reckoning is swift. The person is thinking he is doing something and he has some good deeds, he's going towards some good end, but in the end he realizes all of these things are nothing. It's a mirage. We find that narrations uh, from Imams we see that a person who has committed a sin with correct beliefs is better than a person who is worshipping with incorrect beliefs. Because we see here that, for example, with shirk, a mushrik, they are committing good actions but it's not accepted. Maybe a believer, a Muslim commits sins, here and there, maybe they make some sin, but they are still believing in Allah. So they will get held accountable for that sin. But it does not wipe out all of their other actions. Maybe Muslim is backbiting or uh, oppressing someone else or treating someone else bad or he did something or she did something, Allah knows. Uh, but they are still Muslim. They made a mistake. They asked for forgiveness. But with the condition with Accepting of deeds is one of the conditions is faith. So we see that Imams say that it's the sin of a person with correct beliefs is better than a person who worships with incorrect beliefs. So it's very important to go look at our uh, beliefs. And we see that our beliefs are much more important than the actions. You know, a person can perform millions of good deeds, but they have bad beliefs. You know, it's not going to benefit them in the hereafter. It would be more beneficial to have good beliefs, focus on our beliefs, and have less uh, uh, deeds. But we have very strong beliefs. For example, look at this. If someone memorizes Quran, right? 
They know all of Quran, but they don't know anything that it means. They just read it and they recite it, but they have no idea about anything. Then another person knows one surah, but he gains all the benefit from that surah. He understands it, he grasps it, he knows what it means. All of these things, he puts it into practice. It's much better than just knowing some or reciting without uh, knowing the benefit of it. Reading the Quran also has benefit if we don't know the language, you know. It's still good. I remember one shaykh was telling the story that in, uh, in Africa, the, the guy came to the uh, person reading Quran and said, oh, you don't even know what you're saying, you know. You're just reading and there's no benefit because you don't know what you're saying. There is, he said, uh, there is some benefit, but I'll show you. But I'll tell you the benefit, but I need you to do something for me. Go down to that river and take this bucket and fill the bucket with water. The bucket is dirty. You know, when you fill the bucket up with water, I'll tell you. The bucket had some holes. So he took the bucket, he go down, fill the water, and bring it back. So the bucket is uh, not holding any water. <laughs> it's empty. So he says, go again, try again. He does it again. This is like three times. He said, look, the bucket didn't hold any water. He says, okay, I'm not holding any of this, you know, knowledge because I don't understand. But look at that bucket. That bucket was dirty. Now the bucket is clean. This Quran is cleaning me. It's cleaning my soul even though I don't know. It's better to know what you're saying with Quran. Don't let it discourage you. When you're just reading and don't understand, this is the starting point. And after this, we learn what it means. And we should keep striving to learn that. So <laughs> discussion where we'll talk about it and summarize it about uh, what is relation to faith and good deeds what what do they have with each other what about people who are doing humanitarian work but they maybe don't believe in Allah or are atheists or other religion how does all of this uh, affect them in many different discussions inshallah tomorrow so we're sure some people have divided Allah into many parts. They have, for example, Zoroastrians who believe in duality of God. Christians believe in Trinity, three gods and one God. Hindus believe in multiple gods. Then we have some people who come, believe in God for everything. God, separate God for everything. God of water, God of rain, God of... Uh, sky, God of earth, all of these different things. God of fire, there's so many different uh, things they've made. You know, whereas all these prophets, they came to teach us the unity of Allah, the oneness of Allah, to teach us Tawheed. So we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that those people who are committing shirk, you know, that they are guided back to path, that Allah will show them sometimes that they recognize the, those signs. We're not having uh, hatred towards other people just because they are believing something different than us. But we pray that Allah guides them and brings them back to uh, brings them back to their true nature, their fitra, the oneness of Allah. So Allah says in Quran, Surah 4, Ayat 36, And worship Allah and don't associate anything with Him. Allah is telling us this over and over in Quran. But Tawheed is something that's really overlooked. You know, most people consider it something simple, it's insignificant. This is something that uh, little kids should learn, and, and I know I'm older, I know Tawheed, I know Allah is one, and you know, that's sufficient for me, that's all I need to know. Allah is one. But, you know, they think this subject is very simple. But when you start going down into it, it's a very complex subject with a lot of fields to study. And uh, many things come under the umbrella of Tawheed. It's very, it can get very in detail in many books. We have books upon books upon books. So it's not just saying, okay, I believe in one God and this is it. It's, it encompasses a lot of different things. So it's pivotal to our salvation as people that we need to 
understand and know what Allah means. Because if we don't go into that thing, and we don't delve down into Tawheed, we could accidentally be doing our actions in vain. And call, we could be working against ourselves if we don't understand. For example, what benefit is it to know every fiqh masail, every jurisprudential question that there is, but you don't know why we're doing it, who we're doing it for. We don't know the one who we are doing these ahkam for. It's better to know our aqa'id first, our beliefs, so that way we get firmly rooted when other people come against us to tell us things and bring different ideas and come with uh, against Islam, we'll be able to stand firm and say, this is what we believe in and this is why we believe in it. We have to get to that point where we feel confident that we can defend our religion if necessary uh, by our reasonings. So Ibn Abbas, he says that uh, one time of Bedouin Arab, he came to Rasulullah <laughs> He said, Ya Rasulullah, teach me something from the marvels of the knowledge, like some high level knowledge. Teach me this thing, some special hidden knowledge, you know. And a lot of times we do this too. We are uh, neglecting our basics of tahara and salat and saum, and we are wondering what happens if I am uh, orbiting space and I break my wudu and my spacesuit. What will happen? You know, we're worried about something way out here, some far out knowledge that maybe never will even happen. Like which way is Kibla or Mars or something like this? But we're not worried about the basic thing. So Prophet told him. What have you done with the beginning of knowledge? For me to tell you the higher knowledge of something further out. What are you doing with your basics? So uh, the person said to the prophet, he said, tell me what is the beginning of knowledge then? So he left this other thing and he said, just tell me the basics. What's the beginning of knowledge? So the prophet said, true knowledge of Allah. So the Bedouin, he says, what is this true knowledge of Allah? So Rasulullah, he says that, that you know Allah without a form, without a shape, without a likeness, without an equal, and that He is one, He is single, He is manifest, He is hidden first and last, and He has no equal, no opposite to Him. He said, this is true knowledge of Allah. So when someone comes and asks some far out knowledge, this is what the Prophet gives him. He said, this is your basis. This is what you need to start with. This is what we need to have uh, knowledge of Allah. So who do we go to? We want to learn about Allah. As many people go different places to learn about Allah. Where do we go to first? We have to go and see what Ahlul Bayt says. Our fifth Imam, Imam Bakr salam. <laughs> Hadith is so important. It's small but very, very strong. He says, if you don't know the proper understanding of Allah, then you are not worshipping Allah. He said, you're worshipping something your mind has imagined. Your mind has made something up and you're worshipping that thing and not worshipping Allah. If you don't have proper understanding or ma'rafah of Allah, then he says, if you don't go through us, Ahlul Bayt, then you will, have, will not have a proper understanding of Allah. And then he says, you will be, end up becoming deviated like the other groups. So it shows that if we want to have true understanding of Allah, we need to go through Ahlul Bayt, We see that other groups in Islam are saying that Allah physically has hands, na'udhu billah, or has foot and puts foot in hellfire, uh, it's very strange things, that they will see Allah on day of judgment in a, in a form. All of this is against Qur'an, but we see what happens when we don't go to Ahlul Bayt. There's narrations that say, they, in books of other schools that say that uh, every Thursday night uh, the people in Baghdad used to put some food on their roofs and that the 
They say, Allah will come riding down on donkey into the roofs of the houses and eat the food and leave. Is it something like a Santa Claus, you know, like coming eating milk and cookies and going, you know? And they can't even make the, the hadith like they make a law on donkey, you know, like there's so many other animals and you know, horse and all these other things. We can clearly see this thing is fabricated and that Allah does not take form in, in we mentioned clearly in Quran. Allah, nothing is like Allah. But when you don't go to Ahlul Bayt, this is what ends up happening. So he says that is, we have to go through Ahlul Bayt to get true understanding of Allah. You know, everything that our mind can think of is something that has been created, something that we have seen before, something that has been made by Allah. You know, like maybe it's a combination of different things and we put them together to make something new, but everything we have uh, think of is something that has been seen before, something created. So that means that anything we think of is something less than Allah. It is not Allah, it's something because nothing is like Allah. So anything we can imagine with our mind is something less than Allah. The core fundamental principle in Islam with Tawheed is very simple, one line, Laysa kamitnihi shay, nothing like Allah. This is from Quran, Surah 42, Ayat 11, this Ayat, nothing, anything we can think of is not like Allah. Laysa kamitnihi shay, very short line, fundamental principle in Tawheed. As long as we have this, we know that anything we can think of is opposite of Allah. Allah is not comparable to the creatures. We say every time in Salat, we all say, uh, And there is nothing comparable to Allah. We say this all the time, Surah Al-Ikhlas. So if this is the case, that nothing is like Allah, how do we think of Allah? As people say, I'm going to make Salat, Allah is not like anything else. Uh, how should I think of Allah? Number one person coming to me saying, Allah is al qawi the strong. Should I think of someone lifting weights as strong, you know, that they have a lot of strength? But no, it doesn't work like this, you know. We, we have to uh, go to Ahlul Bayt and see what they say. So we see that Imam says, when we think of Allah, we have to imagine a thing which the mind cannot contain it. It has no limit. He is not like whatever description comes in your mind and nothing is like him. No thought can reach or grasp him. How can he be imagined when he's totally different from whatever is thought of? And he's the opposite of whatever is imagined. He is a thing that the mind cannot imagine and has no limits. Imam says this is what should be thought of when we think about Allah. So we have to imagine that we are worshipping the creator of the, the universe, the creator of all things, who has no form and no shape, the ultimate power in the universe. We see that our seventh Imam, Imam Qadim has beautiful narration about Tawheed. He says, he is the first one who no other thing was before him. He is the last who nothing is coming after him. He is the one who has always existed. He is Qadim. And there is nothing equal to him in the creations who themselves have beginnings. All of us have beginnings. We have a, a start date when we started existing. Allah has no start date. He has always been existing. Imam says, exalted is he from the attributes of the creatures with a great exaltation. So shirk has many different flaws. These people who are believing in multiple gods. There's many ways to disassemble this uh, when it comes to us. So the first thing is if there were other gods, 
in this universe then uh, that were partners with Allah, then they should have also sent us uh, messengers. They should have, uh, we should have seen their authority, their you know, mu'jiza, their miracles, all of these things. But this is not the case. We have not seen this. The only messengers are all coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Nabi Musa, Nabi Nuh, Nabi Ibrahim, alayhi salam, and all these other prophets, all coming from same Allah. Second thing, if there were two powerful gods in the universe, why would they not conquer one another? One would overcome the other one and become the dominant one. Why do we not see this? And why would not one of them take over and control the universe? We see that Allah says in uh, Surah 23, Ayat 91, Allah has never had a child, nor is there be beside him any other god. If there were, each god would have taken his creation aside and tried to overcome the other gods. May Allah be exalted above what they describe. If there were two gods, or more than two gods, there would have been a lot of disorder in this world. There would have been, uh, you know, and since there is no disorder, we see that the world is running on a... Uh, smooth orbit, if we can say, a smooth system, everything is in place, we see that there is only one God due to this proof. This is one of the Burhan. So when a person looks at the universe, they look around, they see that things are working with one another. They're attached to one another. Similar to like a car. A car has many moving parts and all the parts work together and make the car uh, moving. The universe is like one big machine and uh, for example the sun is providing uh, humans with vitamin D and other things that they need. The sun is providing light for plants to grow, heat for earth, it's in, you know, all of these things. It shows that there is only one creator who knew what all of these things needed. I mean if we were one, you know, Earth was a little bit closer, we would all burn. If we were a little bit further, we would all freeze. Allah knows and has all of these things set in motion perfectly. If we had more than one God, we would have much disorder, a lot of chaos. <coughs> and you see there's no corruption in this system, how things work. They all work in harmony. For example, the moon and sun come in their orbit. The moon, you know, the sun doesn't say, oh, well, you know what, today I don't feel like coming in today. I'm not coming in to work today. You know, I'm going to take the day off, but I'm not going to come. No. Sun is coming every day. Moon is coming every day. All of these things are working in harmony. You know, exactly how the creator of all of these things set them in motion. So this shows that there is only one God to put all these things in perfect harmony. Because if there was two gods, it wouldn't be like that. It wouldn't be in harmony. We would see a lot of disruption. Allah says, If there had been in the heavens and the earth besides uh, any gods beside Him, both the heavens and the earth would be in ruins. Allah, the Lord of throne, is far above the things that they say. This is Surah Anbiya, Surah 21, Ayah 22. Another proof. Allah is al ghani attribute of Allah, free from need, independent, doesn't need anything. If you have a partner, like the shirk, the partner with Allah, then you are in need of that partner. That would be a defect, due to the fact that you would be saying that Allah is in need of something else. This goes against attributes of perfection, that Allah is free from need. We know Allah doesn't need anything. So we say Allah has a partner, you are in need of the partner. For example, in business, you need a partner's permission to make decision, right? Or even if they allow you to make decision, they gave you that permission at one time to make a decision without them. Executive decision, something like this. So Allah is free from having a partner. And this would contradict what we know about Allah, being free from need. So this is another proof that Allah is not in need of anything, so there's no way that Allah would need a partner. 
last thing. Uh, these people, like a person who is believing in more than one God, in sure, they find themselves with three situations. They have to agree to, they're in one of these three categories. We sit, they will say that, okay, all gods are capable of managing the universe. All of them. If that's true, that all gods can manage the universe, then what is the point of having more than one god? Why don't they just have one god who can manage the universe? So they say, all of them can manage the universe. So there's no point in having all of these uh, gods. Second situation they find themselves in, that none of them are capable of managing the universe. If uh, that is the case, then they're all useless. There's none of them can do anything. They're all not managing. And then some. Can, the third position is that some of them can manage universe, and some of them cannot. But if one has the ability to manage the universe, but other gods don't, then that one of them who can manage is supreme above the other ones, and the other ones are not gods at all. So that leaves them the position they still have one God. One of the Bedouins came to Imam Ali alayhi salam. To show the importance of this subject of Tawheed and Shirk. Uh, one of the Bedouins came to Imam in Battle of Jamal and asked him about oneness of Allah. So the people got really upset. They said, what are you doing? We're in the middle of the battlefield. We are fighting. We are losing our lives. We are trying to protect the Imam. And here you come along, like of all times you could ask anything. Now you want to come in the middle of battle and say, what is Tawheed? You know, so the people got really upset. They're like, what are you doing? So, you know, the Imam, he told them, no, don't get upset with him. This is the very reason that we are fighting this battle, is to uphold this Tawheed. You know, so they stopped the battle and answered this person's questions. So it shows the importance of Tawheed that even in the heat of the battle, people are shooting arrows at you, going at you with swords, all of these things. The ultimate aim of this life is to understand Tawheed. It's very important. Imam stopped the whole battle to answer questions on Tawheed. We see that Imam Hussein alayhi salam. On day of Ashura, he continued praying no matter you know what is coming. Even the arrows were coming down on him. Uh, people are standing defending Imam and catching arrows, you know. Uh, it shows the importance and the top priority. Tawheed in our life. The great companions of Imam Hussein in that time in battle of Karbala are like no none other. We cannot find any companions like Imam Hussein's companions. They were stood by him through everything. They had very strong conviction in Tawheed. They knew what their purpose was in life, and it was to believe in oneness of Allah and believe in their prophet and defend their imam to the end. They were defending the pillar of monotheism, the pillar of Tawheed on the earth, Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So they risked everything they had for the safety of their imam. One of these companions we'll discuss tonight in Musiba, Muslim Ibn Aqil alayhi salam. So he says, you know, Muslim was an ambassador of Imam Hussein, the one, the emissary, the cousin of Imam Hussein. You know, Muslim story is very tragic. When we go back, we have to take our mind to Kufa to think about Muslim Ibn Aqil. We have to picture lonely, abandoned Muslim Ibn Aqil wandering the streets of Kufa. At one time, everyone was welcoming Muslim. They were all embracing him, welcoming him as the ambassador of Imam Hussein. They were competing just to get a look at Muslim. They just wanted to see him. But now Muslim is all alone in Kufa. 
the city is becoming dark. Then you hear the hooves of the horses on the streets searching for Muslim. The enemy soldiers now, they have come and they are after Muslim. So Muslim is covering his head with his cloak and he's hoping that he wouldn't get recognized. Going through alleyways of Kufa. Imagine they are hunting down the emissary of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he put a curfew and enforced uh, so Muslim had nowhere to go. He was exhausted. All these enemy soldiers chasing him all around. He didn't know what to do. So Muslim ibn Aqil, he sat down feeling sad. He didn't know where to go. He didn't know where his children were. His sons were wandering the streets of Kufa somewhere. He doesn't know what will happen to his sons. He sits down on the doorstep, not knowing what to do. An old lady comes outside and she says, Oh son, what are you doing? She holds the candle. What are you doing here? He asked, he says, All I want is some water to drink. So she gave him some water and says, Oh son, why don't you go home? Don't you have a house to go home to? Don't you realize your wife and children might be worried about you? They have a curfew. Don't you have a house? Don't you have wife and children? Yes. Muslim and then Akil, his tears start to come to his eyes. He remembered his family and his home that he left behind. He said, good lady, I do have a house, but it is far away. My wife and young daughters are at home, and my sons are wandering the streets of Kufa, but they might wait for me forever. And this unfriendly town, I have no home and no place to go. The lady said, Oh son, where do you come from? He says, I'm in Medina to Nabi. I came from the city of the prophets. I came as a guest. You welcome me here in the streets of Kufa. And now not a single soul will take me in their house on this night. She brought her candle closer to the face of Muslim. She said, Oh my God, you are Muslim, the emissary of my Imam, that you are being hunted by Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. What will I say to Fatima to Zahra on the day of judgment if she says, O oh, Ta'a, how did you turn away the emissary of my son Hussein? How can I turn you away? The least thing I can do for you is give you shelter in my house. Muslim hid in the house of this lady. Then her son came home that night. Her son was in the military, in the army. She told her son what was going on. Muslim Ibn Aqil, he said, I want to spend my last night in prayer. I'm going to pray. I feel this is my last night on this earth. So she tells her son, she says, oh son, where were you? He says, I'm hunting, I'm out looking for Muslim with the army we're going to capture him. She gets upset with her son, but he says, oh, I'm just pretending. I'm just going along with this. She made him swear by her his faith, faith in Allah, on the oath of Allah that she wouldn't, he wouldn't say anything. She told him about Muslim in the house, what had happened. And he said, okay, I won't say anything. So he sneaks off in the middle of the night and tells his mother, I'm going to look for the sons of Muslim ibn Aqil. I'm going to bring them back to their father. But this guy, he was treacherous. He only wanted dunya. He only wanted money from Yazid. He went out and got the soldiers and started coming back to the house. Muslim is in his last prayers. He hears the foot, the horses, hooves on the, on the pavement, on the ground. He rushes out of the house. He grabs his sword. Her, the lady, she's standing in the doorway. She says, I cannot believe what my son has done to you. I won't let these people come in my house. They will have to kill me. This lady is devoted to the emissary of Imam Hussein. She said, you have to kill me before you come. Muslim Ibn Aqil, he tells her, I'm your guest, I can't let you die because of me, or in your house be demolished, just let me go out and defend my life. So the soldiers saw Muslim Ibn Aqil rush out of the house of this lady with his sword like a lion, like the sons of Abu Talib. She came rushing out of the house, the Muslim is fighting and fighting, they cannot beat Muslim, so they make a trap for Muslim. 
they dig a hole and they start throwing rocks from the rooftops at Muslim. They start shooting arrows at Muslim. They are not playing fair. They are start throwing fire and coals on Muslim. He is covered with the wounds from all of these things. He starts backing up and he falls into this hole. He falls unconscious. Muslim Ibn Akil, he wakes up with heavy chains on his, on his hands and on his feet. They drag Muslim Ibn Akil through the streets of Kufa. They start, all the people before were competing to see him. Now they were closing their windows on Muslim. They don't want to see Muslim. He's going through all of this for the love of Imam Hussein. When we go, the people start throwing things at him while he's walking through the streets. Similar how it would happen later with Sayyid Zainab in the streets of Sham. When Muslim came before Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad, he says Ubaidullah wanted to look good in front of the people, so he asked him, he says, uh, he says, I will give you the one last wish, any wish that you want. He wanted to look good. He thought that he might ask about his children, about his sons. But no, the one thought of Muslim Ibn Akil was that for Abu Abdullah, Imam Hussein, alayhi salam. He said, if you are true to your word, then send message to Imam Hussein. Tell Imam Hussein to forget about Kufa, to go back to Medina. Obey the law could never do this. He could never accept this. So he ordered his executioners to take Muslim to the top of the roof of the government house for all those people to see. He called all of the town to see and then the sword is hanging over the neck of Muslim's head. His last thought was with his master, Ya Sayyidi, Ya Abu Abdullah, Ya Hussein. Oh, the thing he loved most in life was his Imam. His only regret was up until the end. He couldn't do what he wanted to do most to warn Imam Hussein of the treacherous people of Kufa. The sword came down on the blessed head of Muslim Ibn Akil. Then they threw the body of Muslim off of the roof down on the streets of Kufa. Imagine how many bones a Muslim must have broke when he hit the ground. Ya Allah. If this wasn't enough for them, they took the head of Muslim Ibn Akil and sent it to Yazid. And as for his body, they wouldn't even bury the body of Muslim. What did they do with Muslim's body for his love of Imam Hussein? They took his body and hung it for all the people to look at. Where did they take his body? Not just anywhere. They took his body where the garbage was dumped. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Assalamu alayka ya Abu Abdullah. Wa ala al-arwah allati hallat bifana'ik. Alayka minni salamu allahi. أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر الأحد مني لزياراتكم Altogether السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين يا حسين 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 Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, Ya
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. 